There's going to be no dead quietness tonight. Okay. So let's fix that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, make a noise for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, everything's going to come out of Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 tonight. And uh, I want to talk about your heart. I want to talk about your heart. You got a good heart? I went to the cardiologist one time and because uh, they thought, well, you better get checked out because I was short of breath or something. And so he put me on this, you know, treadmill and I'm going and going and going and my heart's now moving. He goes, well, he goes, well, I'll speed you up a little bit. And I'm going, <laughs> I'm breathing like crazy. I'm going. He goes, yeah, you're just barely going up. And he goes, got to go faster. Cranks it up faster, and I'm like, I mean, I, eventually I'm flying. And I'm going like, I mean, I'm almost not able to keep up with my muscles and my lungs were burning. I was running for almost, well, it was probably eight minutes. And he says, I can't get your heart above 110. Because I started off at 46. Yeah. You know, my, my standard heartbeat is 46. He goes, are you an athlete? I says, can't you tell I'm not? <laughs> and uh, finally he got it up close to 120. But, and he, had, he was raising the incline like crazy. Now my legs are on fire. I'm, I'm running. My legs are on fire. My lungs are burning. I have good news. My heart is so strong, my body can't even keep up with it. <laughs> So then he did all the cross-sectional stuff of the heart, the imagery, and he put it up on the screen. He goes, wow, look at this, look at this, come here, come here, come here. He was, like, he was all excited. I was like, and, he's, and there's this hole going, <laughs> and this other one going, <laughs> and there's all these screens with all your heart all cut up, and I'm looking at all this. He's going, look at that, look at that recovery time. <laughs> he goes, that's why I couldn't get your heart beat up. You have an amazing heart. He goes, man, if everybody had a heart like you, wow. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> you're the expert. And you're telling, thank you. And uh, so, all right, that's in the natural. But how's your heart in the spirit? You know, the Bible dedicates a lot of information to the heart. A lot. You know, God says, David is a man after my own heart because he desires to do all my will. So people say, I want to know why David was preferred by God. It says it in the Bible, because he desired to do all his will. That's it. It wasn't because he was a good soldier. It wasn't because he could quote scriptures really good. It wasn't because he could prophesy. It wasn't because he was a king. God made him the king. He was nothing. He was just ten sheep. But he said, he's a man after my own heart because he desires to do all my will. And the scripture says, keep your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. It's not talking about this. We point at this, but we're talking about the heart the very center of what makes you tick. So let me ask you a question. What makes you tick? What makes you tick? What is the inspiration of your life? You say, well, it's the Holy Spirit. Well, it's this. Well, it's that. Um, but what the heart is, is the heart is an amazing combination. Um, when you look at the temple or the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness that Moses erected, uh, Moses, if you think about it, was looking in heaven at the true tabernacle. And God said, see to it that you make the copy of this tabernacle, this true tabernacle, make that copy just like the one you see. So Moses was staring into heaven and saw the true tabernacle. 
So you don't know what the true tabernacle is by that scripture. You have to ascertain it by a lot of study of a lot of scripture to figure it out. But the tabernacle that Moses was looking at was the resurrected Christ. He was looking at the body of Jesus Christ resurrected. People don't know that. They don't really realize. But it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Okay, so we have to understand that while the tabernacle on the earth, the copy of the one of the true, was still standing in the earth, the true tabernacle could not be manifested. Now it says plainly, I think it's Hebrews chapter 10, it says that um, the veil is the flesh. The veil is the flesh. So the tabernacle, the true tabernacle in heaven, had to do with a resurrected temple, a resurrected body. It had to do with the new body. It had to do with the new tabernacle of God. It was a heavenly realm. Jesus Christ was going to be resurrected from the dead, and the true tabernacle was going to come upon him, and he was going to become the first resurrected man. God says, I do not dwell in temples made with hands. Right. Talking about the tabernacles in the earth. He says, but until this tabernacle is torn down, I can't fully manifest the true tabernacle. So Jesus took on the true tabernacle and was caught away into heaven and remained there. And he was there. And, he, and the kingdom of God couldn't come into full manifestation until the first tabernacle, the copy, was torn down. Moses' ministry had to come to an end for the full manifestation of the kingdom of God to come. Are we, are we together? Now you've got to really pay strict attention because if you don't know these things, then you have to really absorb the details. I can give you details for hours and hours and hours. I just keep studying the stuff for years. And the more I study it, the more I find it. And so the true tabernacle, Moses is gazing into heaven, and he sees the resurrected body of Jesus Christ waiting. It's there. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says very plainly, with what body do they rise? He says, God gives it, talking about the dead body, which is a seed, he gives it a body, which has been prepared for them. Right, right. You see that? So a body has already been prepared for us. Mm -hmm. I don't know where God's storage house is with the bodies, and I don't understand all that. All I know is the Bible says that he has already prepared a body for you. That means a resurrected body is prepared for every man, woman, and child that has ever lived because God intended to save the whole world. Whether they receive it or not, it's already been prepared. And Moses was looking at the body of Christ. He's looking at the true tabernacle. And he then comes and makes a copy. So all he had was rudimentary tools, rudimentary equipment. He didn't even have a backhoe to dig a ditch. He didn't have... He didn't have a circular saw to cut a piece of wood. He didn't have all the things he had today. What did he do? He took animal skin curtains and hung them up in a shape and made an outline. And he called that the outer court. And then within inside of that, he made another inner court. That inner court had two parts. One was the whole, most holy place and the other was the holy place. So the first part, the the. the the entry of the second part, I don't want to confuse you, but there's only two parts. There's not three parts. There's two. There's the outer and the inner. The inner has two parts. The most holy place and the holy place. So when you go through into the first veil of that second part, you come into the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. When you walk through that, then there's another curtain there. And that curtain is keeping you back from the very holy place where the glory of God is. And you pass through that, you are now in the holy place 
where the Ark of the Covenant is, the glory of God, the cherubs, the presence of God hovering over the mercy seat, the blood of Jesus, which has purchased you the right to the rod of Aaron, to the tablets of stone, which is the word of the Lord for your life, and to the golden bowl of manna, which means provision has been laid up for you, and you can never run out of provision. That's why it's the gospel to the poor is you'll never go without if you trust God. Because all of this is covenantal stuff. But all of it is about your body. Amen. It's not about some temple in Israel. Right. God doesn't dwell in a building in Israel. They can build it. He's not going to live there. He says, I don't live in buildings. I live in the human heart. I dwell there. So the, the, the outer core is your body. The inner part is your heart. Now, the inner part has two parts. That's your heart, but it has two parts. One's your spirit, and one's your soul. The heart is made up of spirit and soul. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we see that together. It's important for you to know that within you is... It, that's why it's so inseparable, so difficult to discern sometimes the voice of God from your voice. Because the heart of you is your voice and God's voice. Yeah. God has come to dwell inside of his people. Amen. We think of some big throne room in the sky and there's gold and stuff and there's cherubs and things. No, that's in here. Yeah. It's within us. Yeah. That is the glory of God within us. So stop looking far away for answers and start realizing that I and the Father will come and make our home in you. Yeah, Yeah, it's like if we ever really become conscious fully of what has happened to us, we will be so amazingly dangerous to the devil. Look, I'm talking about myself too. It's It's a growing consciousness. It's, I don't get worried about the details. I just really don't. And what I'm talking about is sometimes a person comes in and they get it partially and they don't get it all. Other person comes in and they fly for a while and then they settle down. And someone else is going, and they don't stop. I don't worry about it. It's about consciousness. Right. Right. My job is to help a people, which includes you, to rise to a higher consciousness about what's real in the spirit realm. Yeah. And as more and more of us become conscious of it, I'm not worried about those who don't make it. I'm concerned about raising those who can hear it. Now, you heard when Aaron and Katrina were leading tonight, they got conscious of that realm, and they started bringing it down on us. Now, some people say, nobody leads me into the presence of God. Oh, yeah, stick around here. You'll get it. They led us into a consciousness. We didn't think of those songs. We weren't speaking those words. We weren't thinking about God in that way. And then all of a sudden, Katrina started going, yeah, she started yelling. It was like, and all of a sudden, she says, you're worthy. And it's like, boom. You think, okay, what's going on? Uh, 20 minutes ago, I was kind of like, oh, hallelujah. And now I'm like, <laughs> you know, what happened? I became conscious of the reality of the God who was present with me the whole entire time. I haven't even opened the Bible yet. I'm just kind of giving you warmed up. <laughs> it's like really important that we perceive this. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm becoming an old man. And like, in a, in a positive way. And I, I just picture myself someday like sitting in a chair, 90 some. And people are coming from every country in the world. And they're going, what's the secret? And they're going to say the simplest things. We're not going to pull some heavy revy out of the sky. We're going to say, it's real simple, son. He wants your heart. And if he doesn't get it, you're not going to get it. And you're going to get left out if you don't open up your heart. One time, I, one time I said something to someone here. I just went like this. I said, you know, you got to get some oil on those hinges. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I said, well, God wants easier access to you. you know, the gospel is not complicated. We are not trying to make it complicated. Re- the ceremonialism and legalism has made it complex. But God wants to unravel the difficulty 
and create simplicity, he really is after your heart. If he gets it, you're going to get healed of everything. You're going to get enlightened about it all. You're going to be able to feed the next generation whom you're entrusted with. You will have disciples and you will be satisfied. He said, out of your inner man will flow rivers of living water. That's talking about the heart, the spirit-soul combination within you where God dwells. He's going to flow a river out of there. Rivers bring life. Rivers bring water to trees, to plants, to us, to everything. Without the water, everything's dead. And he's saying, I'm going to cause life like a river to flow out of you. I'm not trying to wade in the river. The river's in me. You understand, I'm not trying to, look, I understand the, the, the difference between a corporate anointing and a singular anointing, but the river's in me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I'm with you, we dance in the river together. Yeah, right. You understand, but I'm talking about you personally. This whole thing I started off with is, how's your heart? Mm-hmm. Check your heart. Right. Check your heart. Sometimes when I check my heart, I'm not happy. But I always check, you know, uh, test yourself and see whether you're in the faith. See, God's not interested in any other test. He wants to know you to test yourself that you're in the faith. Right. And I don't have time to go through it all tonight, but God does not test the new creation. Right. He already proved it. Right. Yeah, it's true. When Jesus succeeded in everything, he doesn't need to test you. He already knows what he gave you. He gave you the quality of life that was in Jesus Christ is now in you, and he doesn't test his people anymore. He tests them through the Old Testament. He t- uh, people test each other, but God never tests us never. anymore. Okay. And there's only two scriptures in the New Testament that even suggest it, and it's not talking about God testing you, like the testing of your faith. It doesn't say God. Right. It's the testing of your faith. That means you go into life, and problems come up. Yeah. Right. It's right. generic for us all. Yeah. And God's standing there within you going, let's go. He's not testing you. He's within you to win. So, but the test comes and we have to push through. We have to win by relying upon God within us to trust him. Without him, we have nothing, but we are not without him. We have everything. We have him. See, that's why I say I will never grow broke. I will never starve unless I, unless I will to give up my rights, which are in Christ, I will never go without. Paul says, our Barnabas and I, the only apostles who have a right to take a sister as a wife, or are we the only ones that don't have a right? He goes, of course, we have a right. He goes, but we've laid that aside for the gospel. So you don't have to lay aside having a, a husband or wife. They were called to do it. They heard the call. They went after it. And uh, so he's saying, we have a right to it. But he saw something so great, he he was willing to give up everything for it. All right, can we go to Hebrews chapter 3? Now, in light of everything I've just said, um, the kingdom of God is within you. So a question, why is the kingdom of God within you? Wherever God is, the kingdom is. He's within you. If you're still waiting for a kingdom, then you're still waiting for a God. Don't wait. Be. Be. Exist. In Christ Jesus. Exist there. Now this scripture I think is very enlightening. I'm going to cast a new light on it for you just so you may never have seen it quite like this before because we were trained completely wrong about what these scriptures mean. So I'm going to try to help you see what they actually mean. In order to get it right, let me go to Hebrews uh, chapter 10 first and read something to you. Yeah, this will be a little bit of a surprise for you probably. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. For if... We sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. 
but a fearful expectation of judgment and fire indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Wow, that's exciting. We ought to post that one on the board out front. <laughs> the lawful people will read it, and you know what they'll think it means. They'll think if anybody sins, they should expect judgment. And I, I personally have known ministers who believe that's what it means, and they live in fear every day. They're repenting all the time because they feel like they don't feel worthy to be in the presence of God. And so we have to understand the Scriptures in the context by which they were written, to the people whom it was given. It was not written to you. It was not written to me. It's here for our learning, but we have to learn it in the context by which it was written. This was written to the Hebrew Jews. This was written to them who needed to understand that the sacrifices and offerings have come to an end. You can't bring sacrifices and offerings back into the equation with Christ. So uh, it is very true. Uh, in fact, keep your finger there, and I'll show you in John chapter 8. Um, that's why I say the Bible's like a puzzle. You've got to be able to put it together. Um, so I, I think that we have to be careful who we take our doctrines from because not everybody is qualified because they have not put in the time, the calling, or the energy it takes in the years to discern the Bible accurately. And so um, back when I first began in ministry, I really heavily relied on those who were my mentors because I did not understand so many of these things. And so I, I hope that you will understand your part and not try to do someone else's part. It is not the average person in the body of Christ who is supposed to figure out doctrine. Doctrine is supposed to come from God-fearing people who devote themselves to the task of knowing God's word and his will. And so um, I want to show you in uh, John chapter 8. So please be careful about just receiving doctrine from some television person or some pamphlet you read. Or People get their faith unsettled all the time because they're just reading all kinds of stuff. I personally don't think it's wise to read too many things, nor is it wise to listen to too many speakers. And I'll tell you why. Because if you want to grow corn... Don't throw a lot of different seeds in the field because right. you're going to have squash and mushrooms and all kinds of things that you're after corn. It, we want to get a pure harvest. And what happens is when you fill your field with too many seeds, your field is cluttered with a mixture of things. It's better to stay on track. It's better to stay focused. And it's better to keep expanding your understanding instead of mixing other things in all the time. Because what it will do is it will confuse you. Okay, so John chapter 8, it says here, verse 31, uh, Jesus said to those Jews, now right, this is to the Jews, this is not to you, this is to the Jews, who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples in action or in deed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the issue here is freedom. Okay? They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. They understood what Jesus was saying. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Bang. Uh. So, so they were stuck. They said they're free, yet they sin. Yeah, yeah. So he had them. He had them. I mean, he had them right on by the, you know, if you grab that thing by the tail, he had them by the tail. They thought they were free, but the presence of sin right. proved they were not free. Right. All right, come on, you Bible scholars, you guys who are listening and studying. What does it mean that they're not free? You got to be. All, you have to answer this question because if you sin, are you also not free? You see how confusing that is. But wait a minute. Well, I sin too. Well, that must mean I'm not free. He said, if you continue in His Word, you won't sin. You'll be free. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know anybody who's free. I don't know anybody who's without sin. 
You see where this, these lines get marred heavily. If you don't understand the Bible, right now you're lost. You have no answer. In fact, you're praying. You're saying, please, God, give Pastor Christian the answer to this. We don't want to be confused. I don't need your prayers. I already know the answer. I need your prayers for other things. <laughs> All right, so get ready, because here comes the answer. Jesus is going to answer this question. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house. What house? Forever. Oh, this is not a house of the earth. This is the God house. This is the kingdom of God. This is God, the house of the Lord. Will not abide there, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you should be free. So you're like, going, okay, I kind of 75% think I got this mastered, but what about the sin thing? <laughs> but I am a son, so I'm, I am free, because he just said a son is free. But he says, you're not free, because you sin. So it's like this dichotomy, right? It's not a dichotomy. You've got to see it. I'm, I'm building you up on this on purpose. I got you on the hook here for the answer. And it's simple. It's so simple. We read right past it. It says in John 14, 2, he says, I and the Father will come and make our home in you, and you shall abide in the house of God forever. Yeah. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. That one. In my Father's heart are many abiding places, is what it should say. And so he's saying to these Jews, because you're not sons, you're in sin. Because right. right. they'll let you translate. Sin. What does it mean? Missed the, Missed the mark. What's the mark? Sonship. Right. Sonship. Christ. Right. He's not saying because you do things wrong. He's saying because you're not a son, you're missing the mark of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the mark of the kingdom of God is sonship. It is it being in Christ. He goes, a son abides forever. He's free. Yeah. It's not about actions. Yeah. It's about who you are, yeah. what you're made to be on the basis of what he is. That's awesome. Okay, back to uh, Hebrews. I would need two hours really to finish this, but anyway. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. If we sin willfully, what's this about? It's about missing the mark. It's about if we willfully live our life outside of the sun. After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for missing the mark, which is sonship. That's why it's about there no longer remains a sacrifice. Because once you've been enlightened, you go into Christ... If you go out of Christ and you want to go outside of him, the sacrifice of the law no longer is going to save you. Right. It's finished. It's done. No right. more. Right. Yeah. Settling? Is that settling in? You get that? Yeah. It's really important you understand that because these scriptures become great condemnation. All right, Hebrews uh, chapter 3. You ready? Now I think you might understand this better. <clears throat> because this is about Jews under the law who keep resorting back to the law and back to the sacrifice, and this is who he's talking to. So don't include yourself without understanding the context. Therefore, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful to all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. <laughs> For every house is built by someone. Ask me how I know. <laughs> but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a... Come on together. As a servant, not a son. So Moses was in sin. 
He was not in Christ. He was not in the mark, but he was doing what God called him to do because he was leading the people into a purpose which was going to lead to the Christ, which would save everybody who put their trust in God. So I am not saying he did the wrong thing. I'm just saying he, he was a servant, not a son. Therefore, he was in bondage, and he was not in freedom. He was not free at all like uh, Jesus was, nor like we are because of Christ. He says uh, he was a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Where is the house of God? So when I say, thank you, we're here, we are at the house of God, we're talking about the people coming together. Christ is son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Wow. Well, well, how? Wow. You see, you see, it's about the end. Not our end, their end. They were under law. They were in Israel. They were, the tabernacle was standing when this was written. It wasn't until Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 that he wrote and said to the Holy Spirit, indicating that the way into the Holy of all is not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing. They had the tabernacle there. He says, if you hold fast to the end, if you guys hold on, if you don't let go, if you stay in faith, if you stay connected to your confession, in the end, the tabernacle of Christ is going to manifest and the kingdom of God is going to come. The kingdom age will be born. It has come. Some of you are, wow, Chris, Chris, you confused me. No, you were confused by religion. I'm unconfusing you. We're detangling the web of thought. These scriptures do not pertain to you. They pertain to those Jews which are under the law who had, had come to Christ, but they're waffling between these two things. They didn't know how to interact with it. They weren't sure whether to be circumcised. They didn't know whether they had to follow the laws. They were still doing satyrs and new moons. What's going on today? People are going back to the law. They want to revisit the law. Those were shadows and types of the things which have come. When you're busy, you know, when I met Marge, and man, it was fantastic. Give her a hug, give her a kiss. I go over there and make, uh, uh, I try to kiss her shadow all I want. It's no fun. <laughs> I prefer the true thing that has come. And Jesus was coming, and his shadow was cast through the law, and they were embracing the law. But now that the truth thing has come, leave the shadow behind. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's no going back to the law. There's no going back to these things. It's over. Can you say it's over? over. Okay. If we hold fast comments to the end, the end of the age, because it was the end of the old covenant. Uh, therefore, verse 7, as the Holy Spirit says, today... Can everybody say today? Hey. If you will hmm, hear his voice. Now, we're talking about your heart now. Remember, that's what this message is really all about. It's about the heart. Do not harden your heart. Okay? Please don't harden your heart. And sometimes people do. Right here in this room, say truth. We'll read it right out of the Bible. No. Don't harden your heart. You have to really have to learn how to keep your heart from hardening. Don't allow yourself to become prideful or connected to old teachings and old thoughts that cannot be substantiated in the Bible. Rather be open. If I'm reading the Bible to you, you've got to at least be open and explore, begin to investigate, begin to look, begin to study the scriptures with this light that I'm speaking to you so that you can see it for yourself. I don't want you to trust me. I want you to see it in the Word of God. That's why we're all the Bible's own. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the days of trial in the wilderness. Yeah, well, one of the times they tested him was Korah and the rebellion. He balked against Moses. He balked against the, the commands of God. And then the earth opened up and swallowed up him and all the people who followed him. So Moses says, anybody else? And then they, on they went. And, you know, this thing has been going on from the beginning. The ones who hear and the ones who won't hear. The ones who want to do the will of God and the ones who don't want to do the will of God. So we have to be willing to do the will of God. Uh, so in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. Where does strain from God's purpose take place? Heart. No, here, yeah. It's not 
the mind is the heart. Your mind cannot understand the gospel unless your heart is connected to the one it comes from. When your heart's connected to God properly, you will stop fighting this doctrinal fight in your mind because you'll know the God who's promised you such amazing things. Now, the biggest stumbling block there is in the Bible is the fact that it's a free gift and Jesus paid for it and we get it without any effort. And that was the stumbling block that the Jews stumbled over because they were used to a lifetime of law and doing and working and do, obeying. And if they don't obey, they didn't have favor. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and says, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. Believe my words. And you'll have eternal life. And they're like, no way. <laughs> we just, all these generations before us, all the way back to David and back to Abraham and all the boys, they all lived this life. How can you say it? Can be? They stumbled at the stone. But the ones whose heart burned within them said yes to the Messiah. Right, yeah. Because it was promised to them from the beginning that they would have a Messiah come who would lighten their burden. Yeah. Hallelujah. They always went astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my, my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. So the key here is knowing his ways. What are the ways of God? Well, you saw he wiped out the Philistines. He killed all those people. He did, and you, know, you can kind of study God and see all this destruction and problems and everything. You think, oh, my gosh, God is not to be messed with. But you don't know the ways of God. You're just looking at the acts of God. So Abraham and, um, well, all the, the uh, Israel, Israelis, they all knew. They knew the acts of God, but they didn't know the ways of God. David knew the ways of God. Moses discovered some of the ways of God, but David really knew the ways of God. David knew that God prefers mercy over judgment. And David knew if he did something wrong, he could run in and seek out the mercy of God and call upon the mercy. He knew the ways of God. And he would touch that heart and get delivered out of horrendous things he did wrong. Yeah. And then he would stand there on top of the pile when it's all over. I mean, some stuff went wrong, but he never got taken out. Why? He knew the ways of God. He knew what God was like. He knew what his heart was like. God's mercy triumphs over his judgment. He knew that. We need to know that. We need to know that the mercy of God sent Jesus to the cross to die instead of us, and therefore the mercy of God triumphed over his judgment. And anyone who believes that gets in the bullseye inside of Christ, and they are delivered from sin. Yeah, right. Amen. The sin of being outside of God's purpose. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now you have peace. You have rest. Why? You're in the bullseye of heaven. You're in the ways of God. You are pleasing him because you are following after what he loves. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Wow, it's just like amazing. So he said, I swore uh, in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now you got to know about God and you can't get rid of this. He's been this way and he's kind of a rugged old father. He's not changing. Do you know your, your, your father's been around forever? And nobody's been able to change him. And he's not starting now. And I'm telling you, God changes not. So you have to get used to it. No matter how much you can preach a friendly gospel that has no consequences, your father is a God of consequence. And your father also has great mercy who raised up Christ so that those who believe could be delivered from the consequences of his wrath that is there and can't go away because he has got a hot negative post and a positive negative post and that's what makes the battery operate the power of god tr travels between these posts and it says behold both the goodness and the severity of god on those who rebelled severity on us goodness that's what it says in the word why because we know his ways and we enter through Christ in the ways of God to connect with him and receive the full benefit of our covenant. Amen. Right. No. Are we together? Yeah. Yeah. I think that this is very clear, very good. Uh, um, if I was sitting there and hearing this, I'd be like, you know, because the truth affects us all, affects me. Yeah. As I preach it, it gets me more and more fired up because it's like, it's true. It's not my word. I'm just reading the Bible. 
Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Beware. So that's the warning to anybody who wants to do God's will. Beware. Don't let an evil heart of unbelief. It doesn't matter if you got saved, walked in God, have everything right for 10 years. If you start drifting away in your heart, you are in big trouble unless you get turned around. Your heart connects you to the covenants and promises of God. Your heart connects you to Jesus. Jesus said over and over and over and over, if you continue in my word, if you remain with me, if you walk with me. He constantly was telling them, don't walk away. Stay fixed in the truth. As long as you live in the flesh, you have to have faith in this world. We need faith. Uh, so an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, an evil heart means you've departed from God. It doesn't mean you've departed from church. You might even go to a Bible study. You may even say Jesus is Lord. You might, you might still, your mouth might still be talking. But if your heart has departed from him. You see, what keeps Chris Renzi in order and in life is him. I thought of a lot of bad stuff I could do to people when I get mad. Like, oh, I just slap them. They just need to be slapped. And but the presence of God within is like, um, that's not how I treated you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna do what you do. And then I see myself give him mercy instead of judgment. Uh, see, I see his ways. It starts coming because I don't want him to depart from me. No, oh, sir. No, sir. If everything goes wrong. I just say, oh, I still have him. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going through. Nobody can take me out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you understand. If I'm in him, walking and right with him, nobody can take me out. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. Right. And everybody was trying to. Right. Thus I lay it down. One time they almost had him. They just leaped on him and he said he slipped through their hands. Imagine when you grab your buddy and go, <laughs> where'd he go? You cannot be defeated um, if God's will is for you to live and go through. You cannot be. True. Cannot be. All right? So he says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of life outside of Jesus. Sin. Do you see it? The deceitfulness of, this is not about doing bad things. This is about being outside of Jesus. It says, for we have become partakers of Christ, you see? It goes right to Christ. Sin, always right to Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Can everybody say if? Yeah. If? If? Yeah. if? If? Yeah. Okay, so I want the if to be certainty in my life. That's not going to be an if. I'm holding fast. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt? Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. So, yeah, but I got saved. Yeah, well, they came out of Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Who did he destroy? The ones that came out of Egypt. Yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah, but I... Yeah, but I came out. It doesn't matter. I'm, I came out. I gave my life to Christ. Yeah, well, if your heart wanders from him, they came out of Egypt. Their hearts wandered, and he destroyed them. So you got to understand, the judgment side of God doesn't go away. The mercy side is enforced over it. He triumphs over it through Christ. So stay in faith. Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Where does obedience come from? It's that old story. You know, the kid's sitting, I'm sitting down, but in the inside I'm standing up. And then in God's world you failed. So God wants your heart. So I've, I said, well, I, I forgive them. I, I forgive them. I just forgive everybody. And God's never going to be satisfied. <laughs> And he's back at you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I forgave him. Chris. He doesn't ever stop. Yeah. Yeah. He wants my heart. 
And he knows if I, if I get divided from him by unforgiveness, I'm in trouble. So he keeps on, keeps on, keeps on, keeps on. And one day I go, okay, I forgive. And I really release. And boom, it's gone. And then I'm free to continue with him. We must continue with him. We cannot once off, two off, three off, a hundred off. We got to continue with him daily. He's the Lord. I'm the disciple. He's my father. I'm the son. He's training me. He's teaching me. There's a lot of things I don't get right still in my life, but he's targeting every one of them. And this is why I, I almost feel like it's futile to resist. Sometimes I do, but I'm like, all right, you're going to win this bail. I know, but Right now, <laughs> I'm squirming. <laughs> and I say, just help me, Lord, just help me. And he's really not very, um, he may be to you, but he's not to me. He's not really super gentle. <laughs> when he talks to me, it's like, let's go. Get it done. Get over it. And I'm like, could you say it nicer? <laughs> you know, he's just like, he wants us to be free. But he, he deals with the mature, is mature. To those who are growing, he deals with them that way. And to babes, he just gets nothing but kindness. Yeah. So how long ago were you a babe? Then stop expecting such kindness. He disciplines. Nobody spanks their baby. Well, we, we knew, well, we knew some that did. But you don't spank your baby. You steer them, guide them, teach them, instruct them. But eventually, there comes a day every single humanoid should be spanked. Every one. There's nobody who should not be. Anybody who's not is missing out on God's love. They really miss out. It's not about punishment. It's about love. It's about steering that heart. And God uses different means. He will pick up the rod for us. Yeah. Don't you think he won't? All right. So he says... Um, Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So unbelief about what? About the fact that the Messiah stood there with the free gift, which would cost them nothing. They had to leave the works of the law behind and stay in the faith towards Christ. And if they came into Christ, they were in the bullseye. If they're in the bullseye, they do not sin. And if his seed remains in you, you cannot sin. You understand? Because I'm in Christ. It's not about actions. It's not about deeds. It's about who I'm in. So we fight with demonic things and with people's opinions about who we are and what we are. But we, by faith, stay in Christ. And because we fight for what's the best thing to fight for, we do not sin. We are in Christ, and we are delivered from all those things that are coming upon the world. We are not a part of the judgment of God. We are out from under it completely. Amen. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to take five more minutes, all right? Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. Okay, so God's saying there's something you should fear about. God gives rest to his people for free. If you come short of his rest, that means you are working. So there's two things, work and rest. So God worked six days, making, creating, building. On the seventh day, he stopped working and rested. He said, I want you to enter my rest. I don't want you working. The law, everybody was working. So he said, everybody under the law, come to Christ, cease from your works, and by faith receive the rest of the peace that comes. So he's saying to the Jews of that day, there's a rest. Now the scripture is going to go right into the rest in the past where he tried to bring them into rest at different times with Joshua and David, and he's going to talk about that. So don't miss the context here. He says... Uh, Verse 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. See, they were busy working. When you have faith in Christ, you stop working to please God. If your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart, and he knows all things. Christ died for you. 
That's First John chapter 3. So you got to know, if your heart has the capacity, your spirit and soul in union together has the capacity to balk. I'm not doing enough. I don't know if I'm pleasing God. But Jesus said, believe in me that the works I've done, I've done for you to liberate you. And I believe that that delivers my heart from the fear. That means my soul gets cleansed and the power of God goes into effect and my soul gives me the soul life of God. I stop working. Works comes from the fear of the displeasure of God. If you're still in fear, you haven't been perfected in love. Jesus is perfect love. When Jesus comes to bring you perfect love, stop walking in imperfect love. Imperfect love is, I got Jesus and I better get busy doing stuff or God's not going to like me. (laughs) And you always say, oh Lord, I'm sorry I failed. I'm sorry I didn't do enough. It says in scripture, he was in the flesh like us. He knows our weaknesses and he's able to help us because he knows our condition. Yet we're like, you don't understand. This was a hard day. (laughs) (laughs) We really, that's how we act. This is for indeed the gospel was preached to them, but it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So let's use our faith. Please use your faith. Stop trying to gain salvation through work. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to get God's favor. People preach all the time about how to have the favor of God in your life. Yeah, get saved. Done. Done. Well, I want to walk in the favor of the Lord, brother. Well, then give your life to Jesus and walk in the favor of God. If you go beyond that, you're sinning because you're outside of Christ trying to earn what he gave you for free. Hmm. For we who have believed do enter his rest. Now, you got to be able to discern the difference between rest and leaving Christ and not caring anymore. Make sure you know the difference. Rest is a state of fellowship with God that takes away fear and phobic feelings of I'm going to be less than what he wants me to be and end up in judgment in the end. People say, well, you know, at least if you receive Christ now, um, you're going to be better off. Because if you're right, you're just going to die and we're going to nothingness. But if I'm right... Well, that's a very confident gospel you have there. What do you mean if I'm right? God spoke. I only believe because he says. Jesus said. That's it. The discussion's over. Come to Christ or you'll be lost. Period. (laughs) So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Wow. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Oh, I hope you can understand that. Everything that had to be completed and done through diligence and exercise and spiritual principles put in order was done by Christ for you. The works were finished from the foundations of the world for you so that you could walk up and freely go, okay, Father, I'm here to receive the reward of the finished work of Christ. That's amazing scripture. That's an amazing scripture. You, you could say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not here to earn anything, but everything has been earned for me. Could you show me what was earned for me? I'd like to discover my inheritance. Uh-huh. Yeah. We have favor. Now remember, it says in Romans chapter 5, we have access by faith. Oh, by law? No, by faith into this grace. Favor. Favor. Okay, so if you want God's favor, get saved, because that's the only way you can access favor. So favor is grace, the same word. I don't like saying stuff like this because it makes people upset, but I'm going to. Grace is not a very good word for this. Favor is way better. Because it really defines for you that God's giving you his favor free of charge because of Christ by faith. That's much clearer. Now, I love the word grace, so don't get me wrong. Because I understand what it means. But if grace means something else to you, then you don't understand the Greek meaning. So we have access by faith into the favor of God. So don't earn it. It's by faith. Amen. 
Verse 4, for he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day. That means he couldn't remember the verse in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. He has spoken in a certain place. He couldn't remember the reference in the Old Testament. So he just wrote that. In a certain place. On the seventh day, in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, <laughs> another place, <laughs> they shall not enter by rest. <laughs> He couldn't remember the quote. Since therefore, it remains that some must enter it. That means you could have entered it back then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. By faith, it was imputed to Abraham righteousness ahead of his day. Yes. By faith. Wow. Yes. See, faith can get past time and it can get past every obstacle. Yes to bring you into relationship with God. And that's why David had the capacity by faith to access things through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he said, the Lord said to my Lord, God said to Jesus. Yeah. 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 You, you understand that the Christ was speaking before time. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those whom it was first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Disobedience has to do with that inner chamber of your heart, uh, getting kicked out through unbelief. When you have unbelief, you're in disobedience. This is not about God saying, go down to the market, preach to those people, and you don't do it. It's not about that. This is about staying in Christ and not jumping out of him. Oh God, I'm worth a sinner. I'm sorry. I can't do anything right. You're out of Christ. Now you're over here. And then eventually you remember he did it and you go, oh, that's right. What am I thinking? Thank you. Oh God, thank you. And you come back to faith, you access favor again, yeah. and you touch favor. Praise God, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Those whom were first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, so here, so he's talking about in time, how he kept trying to be people into, into faith. And he designates a certain t- day, saying in David, so here's King David, years later, today, after such a long time, God is waiting for people to believe him. After such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice. So every generation has a choice to hear the voice of the one who's speaking. Do not harden your hearts. If he says don't harden your hearts, that means you have the option not to. That means you're thinking about it. Don't. 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 Come on, leap for faith. Go for faith. Believe it wholesale. Come into the kingdom. Come fully into Christ. Don't join Jesus and works. It doesn't work. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. So he, he's saying, with Joshua, I want to give him rest. They didn't enter now, another day came. I want to give him rest again. Therefore remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered the Lord's rest has himself also ceased from his works. As God did from his. I don't know how much clearer it can be. Rest in God is connected to ceasing from works. All right, quickly we'll finish up. Uh, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone should fall after the same example of disobedience or unbelief. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joy and marrow. The reason it says soul and spirit is because that's your heart. Your soul and spirit is your heart. And the two are in one compartment. They're so closely aligned together, it takes the word of God to separate your thoughts from God's purpose. So you're conflicted. Oh, I should do it. I should do it. I should do this ministry. I should do it. I, I think we're supposed to give this money. I'm not sure. I think we should give 500 bucks. No, I say three. There's this confusion. It's because the, your heart has God's in your spirit, but your soul is connected to your heart, or connected to your spirit in your heart. And what happens is your thoughts are conflicting with the will of God. So the more we get in harmony with God, the more clearly we hear what he's saying, and the quicker we get to the point of what we can cooperate. You got it. 
So this, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it can divide joint, bone, and marrow. Well, where does marrow stop and bone begin? It's like so confusing. But the word of God is so sharp, it cut through all the intents of your heart. So that's why I say, sometimes I'm like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this because, Lord, I want to I wanna do your will, yet I have a motive over here. And I kind of think I get away with it. In fact, I might, I might be self-deceived. But then the word of the Lord comes, and it's so sharp. It separates that lying little thought, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh God, yeah, but I was trying to, uh, uh, uh. It was like, oh, God. Gee, all right. Now double it. Oh, okay. Your will be done. And then you do it for the right reason. And you have fellowship with God. We're almost there, hanging there. And verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. Wow, how well I know that. But all things are naked and open to his eyes, the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So you might as well, come on, in your mind, let's be goofy a little bit here. Just strip away your house, your marriage, your job, your clothes. Everything you can hide behind say, here I am. Because you can see it all. I might as well see it as you see it. There's nothing hidden from you. And he sees past your body into your heart. And he sees the intents of your heart. And he's working on shifting your soul out of the ways of this world and into God. That's what he's working on us about. Verse 14, seeing then that we have great, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. This is a shipper's term. Yep. Hold fast. Don't let go. For, you know, you may drift around, but keep stayed on him. So you tie a boat to a pier, you stay it. And it can drift a little bit, but it can't go any further than the length of that rope. I suggest it's time to shorten your rope. Right. Until you're pulled in closer, uh, hold fast to uh, the confession. Our, our our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, without leaving the purpose of sonship. You see that? Yeah. He's not talking about acts and deeds. He's talking about he never left the purpose of the Father. His will was to do the will of God. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of favor. Grace, favor. Let us come to the throne of favor that we may obtain mercy and find favor to help in a time of need. Um, there's only one thing left to say. Enjoy your salvation. It's true. Yeah, that's why we rejoice. <laughs> I worship God big because he did something big. And the more aware I am and self-conscious of what he did, the bigger I worship. Restrained worship is restrained understanding. The more you understand who you are in Christ, the more you understand the favor you have, the greater your encounter with that, the greater your worship will become, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. You cannot hold back the celebration because you are celebrating something you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's stand. I'm Can I sit here. This is really <laughs> It says in Philippians that God is at work within you to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's at work within you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I think the more we focus on how complete we've become and how he has totally invaded our life, and now he's at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure, that fear of him leaves. Yes. Amen. Chris said to me for years, he said, what if we're exactly where God wants us to be? Because, you know, we always sit in the bed, we don't have enough money. Why are we here? Why isn't this working out? What about my job? On and on and on. And he kept saying, you know, 
Of course, I didn't agree with him then, but now I do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what if you're exactly where God needs you to be right now? But you say, but you don't understand where I am. Yeah, I do. If he leads and guides our footsteps in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, then something's going on. And the face of everything in our life is to always change in. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you that you're the provider of everything that we need. Father, that we don't need to look outside of ourselves. We just look inside of ourselves for answers that you have, for victory that you have, for everything in heaven and earth, that all the blessings of heaven you've, you've uh, culminated within us and passed them out. Father, I thank you that we don't have to run ahead. We don't need to lag behind. But you are with us wholly and completely. I bless these people before you. I bless them. I bless every one of them tonight. Father, thank you for their lives. I thank you for their faith. Because of Christ, I pray all these things. Amen. God bless you. If anybody needs prayer, I'm here. Waiting for change.